This talk is not about the physical phenomena of the dying, it's about the mental states of the dying, what the dying may expect, and what they could learn to help the process go more smoothly. There are a number of non-local phenomena which need explanation and the occurrence of non-duality around the time of death is also frequently seen. So remember, when you die, you're going to expand consciousness. So what are these phenomena? First, some books. Uh, that's the book I wrote with my wife, uh, The Art of Dying. It's packed full of examples from um, various, uh, various people that, uh, and experiences. We got over a thousand emails with experiences in them. That's a brochure that uh, I recommend to you can actually get that one at Amazon uh, for about a dollar, I think. We sent it around to everybody, to every PC trust, palliative care trust and every hospice. And it's a nice one to have if you're not used to talking to the dying. This book by Monica Rents, The Transitions, is an interesting one. And I recommend that if you want to go more deeply into the dying process. So you get the diagnosis it's terminal, you're going to die. So you start the dying process. You are usually unprepared. Any mention of your death leads to existential death anxiety. And this in itself has got its own brain signature of increased frontoparietal activity and decreased right and left insular activity. So there is a brain marker for the existential death anxiety. You might like this book, The Worm at the Core, I Like It, by Sheldon Solomon. It's an excellent book, and it will tell you all about existential death uh, anxiety, which we have to come to understand. Is there a way around this? Yes. In Bhutan, death is not hidden. It's an everyday experience. It's a Buddhist community, and impermanence is what it's about. But death is something which um, uh, they... Uh, is very commonly discussed. And uh, it's, they have found that their existential death anxiety is very low. And they found that five reminders of death a day, your death, not other people's death, your own death, leads to happiness. And there's a telephone app you might all like to get called We Croak. And if she wants a book, um, there is one by Hansa Bergwell, which has only just come out, called We Croak. So that's existential death anxiety. So we set out to find what happens when we die. We interviewed the carers of the dying starting in 2003. And it was very easy then to be a world authority after reading about half a dozen papers, because there wasn't much in the literature. There's a lot more now, I'm very pleased to say. Uh, we did retrospective and prospective studies, England, Holland, Ireland, palliative care teams in Dutch hospices, English hospitals, lots of accounts from the public, and we interviewed doctors, nurses, auxiliary staff, uh, and volunteers. The present consensus is that about 90% of those dying consciously will have an end of life experience. So try to die consciously and they're going to offer you medezilam to put you out, don't take it unless you really want to. This is a diagram we put together which illustrates the death process. Start on the left uh, with premonitions. So this breaks a, a part of the uh, time direction because here you get definite uh, evidence that you're going to die. Uh, it can be two or three months, six months, uh, or it can be just the next day. One of the ones I remember is a mother who woke up with a premonitory dream that uh, her daughter had been killed. And she found that her daughter was in bed beside her and it was okay. And the next day, the daughter went out and was run over by a car and killed. And she says exactly the same feelings in, in the dream were reproduced by this. This is about 14 days before uh, death. And here you get deathbed visions. And I'll talk more about those. And then 
I think this probably, and Jeffrey, I'm sure will comment on this, um, is uh, moving to a new reality, which seems to me to be the leaking of uh, non-duality forward. It's full of light and love, etc. Then the time of death, the dead dying person can go out and talk to somebody who they're closely emotionally attached to in deathbed coincidences. I won't talk about terminal lucidity except to say NIH are looking at this and it needs to be looked at. And then there are all the non-local things like clocks stopping, animals howling, bells, lights, shapes leaving the body and so on. And there in the middle is this guy who has, uh, is going to chop your head off. Uh, no, he's not actually, because um, uh, the ideas about dying now have changed uh, considerably. And this is a much better picture of somebody who's going to die. Come, he's going to be there to greet you. So um, here's a story of a deathbed vision. I joined my daughter after an hour at the hospital and we both sat chatting to my mother. She spoke to me about my life and my future, all interspersed with references to these people who are now at the end of her bed. She told us that she wouldn't be there the next day as these people would pick her up when she fell and take her on a journey. We were slightly spooked at her comments, but she was totally at ease. She insisted that we shouldn't cry when she died, which she did. So that's an example of uh, deathbed visitors. Who comes uh, in our series, which was 100 and 118 visions, a quarter were parents, spiritual persons, 17, uh, people know with no when there was no speech, uh, but they were grateful to see them. Fourteen percent, other relatives, fourteen. Um, I'm terribly sorry, but very few angels. So if you're in the UK, you probably won't get an angel. If you're in the Bible Belt and an American palliative care physician, uh, John Lerma says there are loads of, Asian, uh, of angels down there. So go and die in the Bible Belt of America if you want an angel. Friends, not many. Uh, in a very large Japanese survey, there were a few animals, but we didn't find any in ours. So we come to the next uh, step, which is moving to a new reality. And this is unbelievably interesting. It's experienced by about 90% of the dying. It's very like the NDE world. It's full of light, love and compassion, wholeness and feelings of unity. It seems to be a sort of breaking area with spiritual beings and dead relatives are often present. It's, it's rather important as, uh, experience because it seems to be getting you used to what is going to happen. Uh, here's an example. My father was at his, my grandfather's bedside, deeply distressed. My grandfather quietly said to my father, don't worry, Leslie, I'm all right. I can see and hear the most beautiful things and you must not worry. And he quietly died, lucid to the end. So those are the sorts of comments which you get. Uh, is this probably the early onset of non-duality? It's something one should think about because you are, I think, going to go into a non-dual state. Turn the lucidity what Victorians call this lightening up before death. I'm not going to do much with today. There's an NIH study on this. It needs to be looked at. And the very good paper for you is this one by NAM, Journal of Nervous and Mental Disorders, 2009, and Bruce Grayson, 81 cases and case reports. These are people who've had chronic schizophrenia and dementia, haven't recognized their family for years, suddenly sit up, uh, greet their family, welcome them, say goodbye, lie down and die. It's a, a fascinating, fascinating area. Um, then the next thing is uh, how, if you have somebody who's been demented for years in the brain, which is shot through, can you have this clear memory? Could it be that memory is held outside the brain somehow? Now we come to uh, the transformation of consciousness uh, into finally non-duality and death. So this is all around here, which I think is non-dual. 
This is when the deathbed coincidences occur and they go to visit somebody, uh, somebody to whom you're emotionally attached and want to say goodbye. We've got good evidence. It's your emotional attachment which leads it. It leads you anywhere. We've got some people who go uh, under the sea, even some submariners. Animals howl at a distance, clocks stop at a distance light in the room and the light is sometimes transformative it's amazing what this light is like the quality of it and shapes the scene leaving the body so these are all non-dual phenomena uh, which occur uh, at the time of death itself fascinating series of experiences um, my life partner died of aids related pneumonia at home in 1991 I spent the last week lying beside him at home much of the time. On one or two occasions, a look of sheer ecstasy lit up his face and he smiled and looked at something I couldn't see. Now with this, you get experiences also of transfiguration, people who absolutely glow with light at the time they're dying. Now I want to change slightly here and I'm going to now discuss the work of Monica Rentz, who's a palliative care physician in Switzerland. Uh, this paper you can get from me. It's fear, pain, denial and spiritual experiences because I think this is one of the best models we have. If you want the paper, there's my email address. Put in the uh, title box, Monica Rentz. You don't have to say, gosh, Peter, what a fantastic talk you gave. Just Monica Rentz in the, um, in the subject box and I'll send you the paper. She says, and I agree, spiritual experiences are powerfully independent of religious attitudes. And many, many studies have shown that. And let's go back to that Japanese one I mentioned with over 2000 people. Um, it, it didn't relate at all. So what you believe when you come to die doesn't seem to matter. This, what I'm talking about is an 80 patient series uh, from Monica Rentz, three observations a day. It's a very heavy study of work. Three observations and she rated four dimensions, fear, pain, denial, and spiritual experience. So there are changes in consciousness in the dying process, and these go through uh, three phases, the pre-transition, tra transition, and post-transition. So pre-transition, and please, this is the state you must remember. Uh, you are coming up to death, you know that dying is inevitable, you fear losing control, and you must clear yourself of your attachments. It's terribly important, this. Clean, clean, clean. If you don't, you make the whole process much more difficult. And the blocks are uh, denial, I'm not dying, reactivated traumas, very frightened by it all, struggle, strong attachment, well-resolved family issues. Now, all of these you can avoid by preparation. So prepare yourself. And uh, awareness of previous negative behavior is another one. So then take any of that with you, clear all your attachments. Um, and uh, support and release, such as finding meaning, may help patients to move on. That's if you're a carer. Teach about the NDE. Uh, it's very helpful that, and there's a physician in Canada who teaches that and helps, finds, helps the patients. And there's a possible trial of ketamine to mimic the death process, which is given in, um, being given in Belgium. So uh, chemical analogs are being looked at. Transition, it's uh, the loosening of the ego consciousness. So you get distortions of consciousness. And then you come to post-transition. This is a spiritual opening. The ego is not dominant anymore. You're in non-symbolic, non-dual consciousness. Patients seem to be serene in a state of being beyond anxiety, pain, or powerlessness. Most are unable to speak, but can still hear. They communicate by gestures or single words. Sometimes reconciliation, vision, and peace are observed. Such transformative experiences may be comparable to a spiritual awakening or a patient who's completed the journey. So it's very important that you remember uh, that as you come up to it. 
So from these uh, observations, she determined the level. I won't go through these graphs, but to say this is pre-transition, transition, post-transition. Post -transition. Here you can see somebody in pre-transition going through transition, going into non-dual consciousness before they die. Other people have a different course where you're going between the different levels and finally into non-dual consciousness when you die. It doesn't matter what you believe. I was nursing a friend who had definite views that there was no afterlife. In the last couple of hours, she became very peaceful and arose from her unconsciousness periodically saying clearly and happily such phrases as I will know soon. Uh, come on, get on with it. I'm ready to go. And it's so beautiful. She'd immediately lapse back into unconsciousness after uttering these phrases. She was very obviously content, happy and at peace. It was a wonderful experience for her partner and me. So it doesn't matter what you believe, the process takes its own course. I want you to look at this because it's interesting. The yellow ones are no suffering, percentage of patients who had no or little suffering. The blue columns are those who had quite a lot. Well, the near-death experiences, you wouldn't be surprised, have little suffering. Those who've had mystical experiences, the same, and those who meditate, the same. But I want to draw your attention to this column, and that is those people who are curious about the afterlife. And this is the last thing that I want you to remember. You must be curious about the whole death process when you're going through it because you cannot be afraid and be curious at the same time. So be curious and the chances are that you won't suffer. So there are end of life, so what do we teach? End of life experiences, uh, explain them. Learn to give up attachment. Number of mental attitudes and practices can help. For example, meditation. Give confidence, 90% of conscious patients have positive transcendent experiences. It is enough to look forward to death and be curious. So please, all of you, be curious. My friend Thetis Blacker, she's a painter and she, uh, she had a, a mystical experience and she and I spent a lot of time talking about what happened to her and what she was experiencing. We agreed that we'd be at each other's deathbed and um, unfortunately, I was in Japan at the time, but I rang her up and two days before she died and said, Thetis, what is it like? Tell me. And she said, there are rivers of love and golden light pouring through the room. Now, why death not we heard this before? And if nobody had asked Thetis, she would never have told you. People don't. So the actual experiences of the dying are quite different from what we think. Non-dual experiences arise as we die and become, and we become part of the cosmos. So thank you very much for your attention. Please be curious. Please learn to clean and give things up. And if you want Monica Rents's paper, there's my email address and just put Monica Rents in the subject. Peter underscore Fennig at CompuServe.com. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, that was as amazing as always. Um, Peter, are you still there? You are. Uh, I think we have time for one question. If somebody would like to uh, ask something in the chat. I saw something from our next speaker that said, could one say the sheath of the mind drops away from this lifetime? Uh, so that could be a question. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what happens. The whole body goes, the sheath of the mind goes, and the internal uh, pillar of light, which is you, seems to remain. And you go any rate, we seem to, uh, into a field of energy. So it seems to be an energy field that you're going into. You would have Someone. data on this, Jeffrey. <laughs> Indeed. Someone else asks, how do, you, um, how do you feel about your own death and how are you preparing? I think that's probably our last question. Um, I feel very happy about my death. Um, I've come to understand the process. 
um, I actually got the WhatsApp uh, we croak, and I was surprised to see that I hadn't got out of my death anxiety because every time I got a push to remember that I was going to die, I could see that there was still a little tension within me. You'd be pleased to hear that that's gone. And yeah, I'm going to be curious, really curious and see what happens. <laughs>